When it comes to nuclear superpowers, Britain comes in at number five, despite being one of the first countries to begin researching the feasibility of a uranium bomb. But why did Britain feel the need for atomic firepower at all? After the 1939 discovery of neutron-induced fission in uranium, Britain was one of the first countries to start investigating if it could have military applications. While British officials were skeptical, some universities began theoretical research into the possibility of an explosive reaction. In 1940, O.R. Frisch and R.E. Pearls at UK's Birmingham University predicted that a small mass of pure uranium-235 would support a fast-chain reaction. They wrote a memorandum outlining a method in which uranium-235 could be assembled as a weapon. Although it was wartime and other more viable defense projects were being focused on, a uranium subcommittee was set up. This subcommittee would soon become the MAUD Committee, and it commissioned a series of experimental and theoretical research programs at various universities. During the fall of 1940, the British revealed their research plans to America, which had already started a similar program. The British realized the limits of their resources, and collaboration seemed the next logical step. The alliance between the U.S. and Britain was uneasy, and the British expressed reservations about a complete integration of the projects. By the time Britain realized that it would be advantageous to collaborate beyond sharing information, the U.S. project was under the Army's control, and integration was off the table. This lack of cooperation came as a bit of a shock to the British, and Prime Minister Winston Churchill brought the issue up with President Roosevelt. At this time, British officials discussed the feasibility of an independent program. However, with World War II still in full swing, the British were reluctant to dedicate resources to the project, as it had become evident that any such program might be too late to influence the war's outcome. The British-American relationship got back on track in 1943, when the U.S. Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, and the Director of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, Vannevar Bush, visited London. They met with Churchill and successfully resolved several misunderstandings from both sides. The two countries then started to draft an agreement for the future integration of the bomb project. The points in this draft were included in the Quebec Agreement, signed by Roosevelt and Churchill on August 19, 1943. When the two countries compared notes on their respective projects, it became clear that the British should abandon their efforts in England and concentrate on assisting the American team. The progress and the scale of the American project far surpassed that of the English project. Where the Brits had spent around half a million pounds, the Americans' estimate of the total project cost was already over $1,000 million. Many British scientists traveled to America to assist the team on the Manhattan Project which produced the world's first atomic bomb. The McMahon Act, also known as the Atomic Energy Act, was passed in 1946, taking control of the atomic bomb from the military and placing it into the hands of a government committee. This act also cut ties with Britain, meaning any information was now top secret. After World War II ended, the USSR and America, which had been allies during the war, started squaring up with each other. Both countries were suspicious of the other's social structure, and their alliance during World War II had always been an uneasy one. Britain sided with its fellow capitalist country and supported America. But without access to America's atomic bomb, Britain realized that they would have to build up their own nuclear capabilities before the Soviets. In January 1947, plans to develop a British atomic weapon were approved by UK's Prime Minister Clement Attlee. British scientist William Penny was asked to head the project under Lord Portal of Hungerford, who would oversee the scheme. Penny had been one of the scientists sent to America to work on the combined project and had been at Los Alamos, witnessed the Nagasaki bombing, and worked on Operation Crossroads, a pair of nuclear weapons tests conducted at Bikini Atoll in 1946. The Atomic Energy Act had classified many of the secrets of the American atomic bomb. Still, it did not stop the prominent British scientists who had worked on it from coming back to work on the British project. However, General Groves, who directed the Manhattan Project, had taken steps to limit British involvement so that none of the returning scientists had a complete picture of the Manhattan Project. Penny's first act was to draw up a document containing all the information they could gather. The paper was entitled Plutonium Weapon General Description and was a compilation of all the notes of the various scientists who had worked on the project. Three research centers were established, one in London, one in Woolwich, and the third in Fort Halstead. 
The program was split into three areas, research run by John Crockford, armaments headed by Penny, and engineering under Christopher Hitton. The engineering division was responsible for constructing the nuclear plants that were to produce usable plutonium. Although some of the plutonium used was sourced from the Chalk River site in Canada, Heaton's reactors produced the primary source of plutonium. Britain's first plutonium plant was built in Cumberland at Sellafield. It went critical in 1950 and was producing usable plutonium two years later. The British based their bomb on the same design as the American plutonium implosion bomb, using notes from Penny and Fuchs. Unfortunately, Fuchs also passed the information on to the Soviets who were able to complete their bomb by 1949, beating the British by three years. Negotiations to revisit the previous collaborations between America and Britain were underway. However, the revelations that Fuchs, plus at least two other British nuclear scientists, were Soviet spies ended all hope of another integrated project. America's anti-communist fervor led to them refusing to allow Britain to test their first atomic bomb at Frenchman Flat in Nevada. Due to America being off-limits for Britain's nuclear tests, Winston Churchill, who had been re-elected in 1951, negotiated the use of Montebello Island off the northwest coast of Western Australia. On October 3, 1952, the third country in the world to develop a nuclear bomb completed a successful test. It was dubbed Operation Hurricane, and the bomb was detonated inside the hull of a frigate called the HMS Plym. The reasoning behind this was the very real threat of an atomic bomb being smuggled in a ship, and the British wanted to see the effect should this occur. All that was left of the HMS Plym was a gluey black mess that washed ashore after the explosion. The explosion left a crater in the seabed measuring 20 feet deep and 980 feet in width. The fallout cloud rose to 10,000 feet and was supposed to blow out to sea. However, the wind reversed and the cloud blew over the Australian mainland, causing low levels of radiation to be detected on the east coast of Australia in Brisbane. The effect on local flora and fauna had been discussed in the British Parliament. Still, it had been dismissed, with Churchill joking that the survey team had only seen some birds and lizards. In fact, the amateur biologist who collected samples of wildlife from the islands before the explosion had found over 400 species of animals and plants including 20 new types of insects, six previously undiscovered plants, and a new species of legless lizard. A 2006 zoological survey was surprised to discover that most of the wildlife on the islands had recovered, and the detonation had not doomed the legless lizard to extinction. Nowadays, the area is a park, with an obelisk marking the explosion site. While the radioactivity of the island had diminished enough to allow casual visitors by the 1980s, people are still advised not to spend more than one hour per day at the test sites. The success of the detonation was overshadowed when, just four weeks later, the U.S. successfully completed a hydrogen bomb test. The next race was on, but again, the USSR beat Britain to the punch, this time by two years. The Brits tested their hydrogen bomb in 1957, by which time the Soviets had advanced even beyond the Americans by sending their first official satellite into orbit. Due to this new development, the Americans no longer had the clear military advantage and agreed to amend the 1946 Atomic Energy Act to allow for further collaboration with the UK. Today, America and Russia each have between 5,500 and 6,500 atomic weapons at their disposal, while Britain has just 225 strategic warheads. When it comes to building nuclear weapons, it truly was a case of thinking about whether we could without stopping to consider if we should. Atomic energy was hailed as the future of power, but the military applications were just too tempting not to explore. Had these discoveries come during peacetime, the outcome may have been quite different. At first, Britain wanted to develop nuclear weapons to aid them during World War II. The idea of atomic power had been floating about, and Britain feared that Hitler was developing a nuclear bomb. A German physicist, Otto Hahn, first split the atom in 1938. When Germany seized Czechoslovakia before the war broke out, it was common knowledge that Europe's only uranium mine was in the mountains. In 1938, a German metallurgy company called Auer Gesellschaft started shipping uranium to Northeast Germans to begin producing high-purity uranium. The Nazis then seized Norway in 1940 and took over the Norsk Hydro Vomork plant, which produced heavy water, another key component for making an atomic bomb. 
The Nazis were also able to obtain Europe's largest remaining uranium stocks at Olin in Belgium. Hitler was on his way to becoming a nuclear power. Churchill's greatest fear during the Second World War was that Germany would build the world's first atom bomb, and his concern was not unfounded. Churchill was so sure that a nuclear strike on Britain was possible that he developed an early warning system and strategized ways that might protect the population. It could be said that, as well as the scientific community's curiosity, it was this fear that led Britain to start research on a uranium bomb in earnest. Alongside their theoretical research and later experimental collaboration with the Americans, Churchill took other measures to try and keep an A-bomb out of German hands. He enlisted many men and women to engage in suicide missions to foil the Germans' efforts of making weapons-grade uranium. In the end, a small group of Norwegians led the most successful act of sabotage in World War II and raided the hydroelectric plant in Vermork. By destroying the Nazi source of heavy water, they successfully disrupted Hitler's production of an A-bomb. To quote Churchill, Never was so much owed by so many to so few. It is jarring to think of how different the world might be if the Nazis had been the first to build a nuclear bomb. After the war, a new threat spurred Britain's desire for nuclear armament. If the US and the USSR were doing it, the Brits would jolly well do it too. But the race for atomic arms continues to cast a shadow over the future, and the threat of mutually assured destruction is still the only safeguard the world has against nuclear war. Despite our many advancements, it seems the world's fate still hinges on who can make the biggest bang. We hope you enjoyed our video about why Britain built nuclear weapons. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description.